Betty, can't hear you. Hi guys, welcome back to another webinar. Let me just check whether my Facebook Live is on. Sometimes it goes to. So we have been having very many, many, many web webinars, and uh, some are very, very interesting. I learned a lot, a lot. So um, and then I would like to welcome back uh, Dr. Alexander Tan, because he's my colleague in Sunway, and um, yes, this is the second talk he's given to us. He giving he has given us previous talk on um hyperglycemic uh, emergency. So now we are going to talk about diabetes mellitus, the evolving paradigm, since there are so many drugs, um, new drugs, new group of drugs uh, that we need to familiarize ourselves with. And of course, the guideline is forever changing. So what we have learned before this may not apply anymore. So without further ado, uh, Alex, go ahead. All right, thank you very much, uh, Betty. And uh, yeah, thank you for inviting me back. So I'm glad that you asked me to talk about diabetes and not on how to apply makeup. Uh, so <laughs> okay, sorry. You like, you like that one, huh, Betty? So <laughs> let me tell you a story. When, when Betty first asked me to give this, she said that whatever you do in your talk, you must have this word. You must have this word, paradigm. <laughs> firstly, I, I, this word, Betty likes it so much. I don't know why she likes it so much. Uh, there's a clinical trial okay. in heart failure I know called Paradigm, but otherwise I'll tell you why. Because more. every time there is a keynote speech or let's say um, a very uh, a renowned speaker, all I see is the title will have Paradigm. So oh, that's why I'm so... I, <laughs> I laugh when I see this word, you know, <laughs> paradigm. It's like... Every, and then I'm like, okay, uh, I want to make myself, um, you know, like high apathy a bit. Lah. So I want to put the word paradigm. <laughs> but apathy, lah, no. Lah. Okay. So okay. you need to know what paradigm means, okay? Because paradigm is just a way of looking at something. So a way of doing something. So a way of looking at something, right? It's like, uh, exactly if you read on the screen, right? In education, if you, if you think that the way to teach people is to have one teacher in the front of uh, 60 to 100 students give a lecture, that's a traditional paradigm. And then of course, nowadays we know that you can have small group learning, you can have self-directed learning. And of course, now here we are on Zoom. So it's a different paradigm, but paradigm is basically a way of looking at something. And what Betty has actually sort of hinted at is that we've, uh, since 2015 actually, slowly changed the way we look at diabetes. And sometimes the problem is when you're stuck in diabetes for so long, you have the same views, the same views, but you can't get out of the maze until you change the way you look at it and you find a solution that was perhaps always there. It's just that you didn't know your way of getting there. Now, the thing about it is um, there's, I need to take you back a little bit in terms of history. You also understand what has changed. You need to know where we have actually come from. Now, this is, is a, I have many, many different types of these slides, okay? But this is just a summary of why type 2 diabetes or and even any diabetes is actually such an evil disease. All of you are medical graduates, you should know this. You should know that diabetes is a terrible, horrible disease, right? It can give you early mortality, it can give you uh, dialysis, it can give you blindness, it can give you amputation, it can give you tuberculosis, carbuncles, etc. Um, and of course, you know, the end, end stage, right? The Avengers end game is that you get figures like this. Every 10 person, somebody dies from diabetes and they die early. And the thing that you need to realize is the number one leading cause for why people die in diabetes is cardiovascular disease. This is stuff which is, you know, nothing has changed about this. People are still dying from diabetes, mainly from cardiovascular disease. And this includes, of course, cardiac diseases, but also things like stroke. Um, and if you want to look at some of these figures, you can actually sort of see that if you have a 60-year-old man, uh, or 60-year-old female, okay, they will have a life expectancy in Malaysia until about, let's say, 75. But if you have type 2 diabetes, you minus six years from their life expectancy. 
If you have type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease, you minus 9.1 years. But if you have type 2 diabetes and you've had an MI or a stroke before, your life expectancy drops by more than one decade. Okay, so this is, this is really important. Just the diabetes itself, right? Uh, earlier mortality, but once you have your MI stroke, you know, basically it's one decade of life gone. Um, so instead of dying at 75, you die at 65. Okay, and this, this is uh, bad. And this is something that we've always known about. Now, the traditional way to look at diabetes has always been this, and I have to sort of dig up old algorithms. And then these are just, I'm showing you the ADA, ESD. ADA stands for American Diabetes Association. EASD stands for the European Association for Diabetes. Um, and these are the two biggest dogs in diabetes. They bark the loudest. They're the two biggest. This one, so they, they, every few years, they'll join together and come up with an algorithm. And you actually see that the traditional way to look at diabetes is to aim for the HbA1c. Okay, you diagnose already, you need to give them at four main. And if the HbA1c is okay, you stop. H1C not okay, you add something else. H1C still not okay, you keep adding things. And, and this is a very simplified version of looking at things. Everything marches to the beat of HbA1C. Okay, If you get your HbA1C at target, then you're fine. If you don't get your HbA1C at target, you need to keep adding and keep adding and keep adding. Okay, And this is, is um, now all changed. Why? Because Betty has actually already told you that we have new drugs that have um, very good non-glycemic effects. So um, these drugs are the SGLT2 inhibitors and the GLP-1 receptor agonists, mainly because they've done very big trials, which I'm going to run through summaries of them very soon, which have shown that these drugs have got extra effects, not just the glucose lowering, they have extra effects that help to protect our patients. Our patients with diabetes now have cardiovascular and renal um, protection if you give them these agents. And let me show you what I'm talking about. So the first trial I'm going to talk about is this trial called Emparec Outcome. Yeah. Emparec Outcome um, used a drug called Empagliflozin. Um, so what, what we see is that patients who were on this drug, their risk of cardiovascular death Okay, okay, first of all, if you want to talk about, uh, let me get my pointer out. We're going to talk about this thing called three-point maze. Three-point maze is a, a combination of cardiovascular death, uh, having an MI and surviving that MI, or having a stroke and surviving that stroke, or having an MI or stroke and not surviving. Okay, if you take that as a composite endpoint altogether, it reduced that by 14%. But if you just look at death alone, which is a very strong endpoint, this is an endpoint you do not come back from. There is no rehab after death. You stroke, you can rehab, right? You have an MI, you can rehab. You can have a, 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 a comeback. But if you die from a stroke or an MI, okay, there's no coming back. But when they were given empagliflozin, it, it reduced their chance of death by 38%. It reduced their hospitalization for heart failure, HHF, by 35%. And in fact, when you look at all cause mortality, so even if you don't die from a cardiovascular death, being on this drug actually reduces your chances of death from whatever cause, all cause mortality by 32%. And in addition to that, it also reduced nephropathy in these individuals by 39%. Now, you may be wondering here, well, you know, drugs that lower glucose, they can do all these things. Lah. You know, glucose high, you lower the glucose back to normal, it should reduce your chance of death, heart failure, mortality, uh, and kidney disease, right? But the thing about this is that this trial was basically done where the glycemic control was uh, taken to be equivalent, right? So, so what happens is you got two people with the same HbA1c, but one of them is on empagliflozin, okay? And he has all these benefits that the other guy, even though he has the same HbA1c, same cholesterol, same BP, etc., did not have. So these are very powerful drugs because you see now what we're looking at is, is not just about the HbA1c. Yes, HbA1c still remains important and I'll tell you why shortly. But if you prescribe these drugs on top in your effort to reduce HbA1c, you use these drugs, you get all these other benefits. And, and to me, the biggest one is of course death. If you lower death, then that is a fantastic outcome, right? 
And then you have all these other good things. You lower hospitalization for heart failure. You lower nephropathy as well. Now, here are some of the Kaplan-Meier curves uh, that, I was, uh, that illustrate this point. Empagliflozin is in red, placebo, right? It was, is in um, black. And you can see that patients who are on empagliflozin, they had this 38% relative risk reduction for death, 35% reduction for heart failure. What you need to also notice is that the curves separate very early on, right? In below six months, and I'm going to show you data now that it's even earlier than that. So this makes these drugs extremely, extremely, extremely powerful and almost like automatic. If you have patients who have heart disease, if you have patients who have renal disease, uh, and they are having diabetes, then these are drugs that you must, must, must be uh, uh, giving to them unless, of course, they are contraindicated. Now, one of the ways that they did the analysis is to say, well, how long did a patient have to take the empagliflozin before it started to reduce their risk of death? Basically, from 59 days onwards. So you take this drug for two months, right? Okay, diabetes is not a disease for a few months. Diabetes is a disease for years and years and years. But yet, if these patients took the empagliflozin for two months, they already started to get protection uh, from uh, cardiovascular death. The data is even more impressive for heart failure. In fact, these drugs actually can be now used to treat heart failure even in patients who don't have diabetes. So if you take this drug, right, you have diabetes and you take this drug for 17 days, right, your risk for getting hospitalized for because of heart failure, just after 17 days, right? Um, that's slightly short of three weeks. They get protection from uh, uh, hospitalization for heart failure. And so because of this really profound, profound effect on heart failure, people began to sort of even realize that, wait, why don't we just use it in patients who do not have diabetes? So I'm straying out of my territory already. I'm now giving you data, I'm showing you data from this trial called Emperor Reduce, okay? And these are patients who don't necessarily have diabetes, but they do have heart failure. Everybody in this trial has got heart failure. And what you can actually see is that it is, again, so, very, uh, so much more powerful in terms of it reduced their hospitalization for heart failure by 30%. And if you combine these two outcomes, hospitalization for heart failure and cardiovascular death, okay, it reduced it by 25%. Again, it's able to reduce death. Again, it's able to reduce heart failure in patients who are not necessarily having diabetes. So again, this is a strong uh, heart failure drug uh, to be using. So if you have a patient who has got diabetes as well as heart failure, you have to find a pretty strong reason why this patient, these patients should not be on this drug. Again, when they did the analysis of this, they found that there was this nephroprotective effect. So you'll see that in purple is the decline of your glomerular filtration rate, right? Your renal function declines more slowly if you were on empagliflozin compared to if you were not, okay? And these are patients, again, who are not necessarily having diabetes. We are expected to have a decline in our GFR as we grow older, right? There's no turning back. It's like white hair, sure will come one, right? Your GFR will sure drop as you grow older. However, if you took the empagliflozin, Right, your yearly decline in your GFR was less than compared to when you were on placebo. Now, this is not just for empagliflozin as well, because there were very similar findings for other members of this group. So this is canagliflozin. You can see it's in blue. Uh, placebo, in this case, is in orange. And you can see this reduction in MACE with canagliflozin uh, over a six-year period. Highly statistically significant. Hazard ratio is 0.86, which is a 14% reduction. Okay. Uh, this one doesn't show the Kaplan-Meier curve, but you can see that with dapagliflozin, right, they found that it reduced heart failure by 27%, and it also reduced nephropathy by 40, 47%. And dapagliflozin actually also has got a trial looking at just pure heart failure patients called DAPA-HF, uh, and they also found benefits there. So it seems like this class of drugs does uh, benefit patients in terms of cardiac heart failure, especially, and renal outcomes, um, even in patients who are not necessarily having diabetes. Now, um, moving on to a separate class of drugs called GLP-1 receptor agonists. Uh, these GLP-1 receptor agonists actually reduce um, um, in very, very much the same, 
same way as with the SGLT2 uh, receptors, I'm showing what UAGLP1 called liraglutide. It's uh, these class of drugs so far are injectables, although orals are coming soon. Um, and you can actually see reductions in CV death, three point maze, cardiovascular death, and all cause mortality. Uh, again, impressive reductions compared to placebo. This is not just with one agent, liraglutide, semaglutide, which is available in Malaysia once a week uh, injection, whereas liraglutide is older, it's once a day injection. Again, you can see this reduction in three point maze has a ratio of 0 0.74, giving you a 26% uh, relative risk reduction again highly statistically significant. You can see the kaplan meier curves separating quite clearly. Um, this is with dulaglutide in a trial called Rewind. Dulaglutide is another once a week uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist. And again, you can see this reduction um, in three point maze. So again, these, these classes of drugs, they do confer this lowering of stroke, lowering of cardiovascular death, lowering of MI risk, and uh, in the case of the SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, lowering of your nephropathy and especially heart failure risk as well. So just, I know I've run through all this kind of uh, data really, really, really quickly, all right? Um, oh, and, and in dulaglutide, sorry, there is actually data for dulaglutide to show that there is a renal benefit. So I know I've run through that kind of uh, data really quickly because I really want to show you how the guidelines the paradigms. Yes, the uh, paradigm. paradigm. <laughs> the paradigm all goes down. No, uh, how the paradigms have changed. Because I've shown you that earlier on, everything is just HbA1c, 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 HbA1c. Somewhere along the line, um, around 2010, um, they came up guidelines that says, yes, you have to lower the HbA1c, but make sure you do it safely. Okay. But really, uh, uh, 2016 onwards, uh, 2018 onwards, uh, they started to sort of say, look, don't just look at the HbA1c, look at what else you can do to lower a person's risk of death, to lower a person's risk of MI, to lower a person's risk of uh, renal disease, apart from lowering the HbA1c. So you want to lower the HbA1c, okay? Right? But in addition to that, if you can lower it using agents that have extra benefits. This is very similar to the case of ACE inhibitors and ARBs. Right, you want to lower the blood pressure. You still chase after the blood pressure, right? But if you give them an ACE and an ARB, especially if they have heart failure, for example, especially if they're post MI, for example, especially if they're renal disease, for example, okay, the uh, uh, an ACE inhibitor ARB is protective in patients, right? Apart from their blood pressure lowering. But that's not to say that you just give patients an ARB and then after that. Uh, you forget about everything, right? You give patient already an uh, angiotensin receptor blocker, but the BP is still 160 on 80. On 80. To lower it, lower it. Um, you will know, will know. Will have, uh... So again, what they are actually saying now in 2021 is that if you have drugs with demonstrated cardiovascular benefits, you should be recommending this uh, for uh, patients independent of HbA1c and in consideration of specific risk factors, which I will run through uh, when I come to the Malaysian guidelines. Now, this is what the uh, guideline of the ADA now looks like. Last time, so simple, right? Okay, you just get a few boxes. As long as the HbA1c is, is high, then you move on to the next one, to the next one, to the next one. But the world is really not the same anymore. Okay, so what they're actually saying is that in terms of specific risk factors, so if you have patients with ASCVD, that stands for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. I mean, you can have valvular cardiovascular disease, all right? You can have congenital cardiovascular disease. But if you have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or a high risk of it, or you have heart failure, or you have chronic kidney uh, disease, then you should really be prescribing SGLT2 emitters or GLP-1s, because the data shows that in these individuals who have ASCVD or CKD or heart failure, there is a clear, clear, clear benefit apart from just lowering the glucose. It gives them mortality. It gives them renal protective. It gives them cardio protection as well. Okay, let's do a little bit of zooming in. Um, so yeah, if you have a high risk or established ASCVD, then 
consider independently of A1C. So what, what has changed so much, right? 2006, we were sort of saying, look at the HV1C and look at the HV1C alone. And if the HV1C is still high, use more drugs. But now they're saying consider independently of the A1C. You still consider the A1C, but you consider independently of it as well, all right? That if you have patients who have ASCVD, arteriosclerotic cardiovascular disease, you either all use a GLP-1 or an SGLT-2 with proven benefit. Now, there are SGLT-2 out, SGLT2s out there who haven't been able to do a cardiovascular trial. For example, uh, some of the Japanese SGLT2s, they just don't have the finances to do a cardiovascular trial. So what the Americans are saying is use those which have the data. Okay. Again, GLP-1 receptor agonists, not all of them have got a cardiovascular outcome trial. Uh, so what they're saying is you need to use those with proven cardiovascular benefit. Now, if your patient has got heart failure, then really it's SGLT2s that have uh, really, really uh, 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 got benefits for this patient, even if they don't have diabetes, in fact. Okay, so again, SGLT2 with proven benefit in this population because uh, you know some of the SGLT2s don't have trials. If you have got chronic kidney disease, right, the question they ask is if it's diabetic kidney disease, you would prefer that they have an SGLT2 or a GLP1 because not all the GLP1s have got uh, 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 kidney benefits but they would prefer that you put them on an SGLT2. Now, if they don't have diabetic kidney disease, they have chronic kidney disease due to other factors, for example, okay, um, they still actually um, say that if these are patients who are at increased cardiovascular risk, then you can either give an SGLT2 or, or a GLP-1. So it comes down back to the same thing, actually, right? Um, um, these drugs are nephroprotective. These drugs are cardioprotective. And so the ADA sort of says, again, the stress is on independent of the HbA1c. You still consider HbA1c, but independent of that, if you have a patient who's got renal disease, diabetic kidney disease, SGLT2. If they've got heart failure, SGLT2. If they've got atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, right, either GLP1 or an SGLT2, or why not, in fact, both. Okay, so I'm moving on. Moving on because here in Malaysia, about a month ago, uh, Betty Tay's BFF uh, <laughs> launched the new Please. <laughs> okay, go on, go on. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's stick to diabetes, please. <laughs> By the way, right, Betty Tay makes very nice Nyonya quiz. Um, <laughs> no, no, I bought, I bought. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that is a full disclosure. She, 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 she gave Nyonya Kue, I eat. I so I bought the, him uh, Nyonya Kue because he gave us a stock the last time. <laughs> so anyway, um, of course in Malaysia, you know, who are we, right? We look at the American guidelines and we have to sort of uh, 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 look, uh, uh, follow lah, okay? So um, just, just a quick summary. They, again, very clear. Recent cardiovascular outcome trials have got benefits beyond glucose uh, lowering. Independent of HbA1c, two class of glucose lowering drugs, i.e. the GLP-1s and the SGL2-2. And as a result, the special word, paradigm shift. <laughs> we now have a new way of looking at things. So not just looking at the HbA1c. Now, however, um, I think there is, there is a realization that some people might be doing the fire and forget kind of trick, right? So, you know, um, like what I said before, you can give somebody an ARB, but their BP still 180 on 100, despite the ARB, you don't stop there, right? You still have to uh, try and get their BP under control. Um, so again, with HbA1c, I think what the Malaysian CPG is trying to stress also is that uh, A1C still remains an important goal, all right? Uh, and you might need more than one drug, just like in hypertension, you might need more than one drug, okay, with different, different uh, um, uh, uh, mechanisms of action to actually achieve your target. Um, so here's what our uh, CPG kind of looks like. Uh, just going to run through it uh, relatively quickly. So again, starting with lifestyle modification, okay, that's very important. If you're overweight, if you're obese, you need to lose weight, you need to diet, you need to exercise, especially if you cook for 30 people over Chinese New Year and eat for 30 people. 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, uh, please the, stick to diabetes, please. I am sticking <laughs> to diabetes, right? This is diabetes related. Lifestyle modification is an important point in diabetes, okay? So, um, um, and metformin is still uh, the first line. This is going to be up for debate. I'm going to be debating some Singaporean endocrinologists uh, in the middle of the year about whether we should still put metformin at first line. But anyway, uh, it is recommended by the CPG. Um, then the next point that they want to make is that, look, HbA1c is still important, right? There are these many new fantastic drugs that can lower CV events, that can lower nephropathy, okay? However, it is still a priority. Now, the thing about HbA1c is that there are individualization of targets. Just like with your lipids, there are individual targets. If you have higher risk patients, you want to aim for lower lipids, okay? Uh, so HbA1c, again, you have targets which are individualized, but you still need to try and reach the target. Uh, one thing which they do put in, because we are not American, we are not European, right? Uh, we have patients who are coming from Bukit Damansara, very, very rich. We have patients coming from, okay, I don't want to say, but we have poorer patients, right? I'm scared one of somebody in this talk, I don't know, lives there. So yes. anyway, uh, cost of newer medications may render them inaccessible. And what this is saying is that it's a polite way of saying, no money, no talk. You want to give these patients these new fantastic drugs, SGLT2, GLP1, but I do it. You cannot magic money into their pocket, right? Okay, so this, this sort of says that, look, um, we may be limited by finances, just very realistic, okay? Um, and then, of course, don't go and chin chai use things that have not got clinical trials. La. You need to make sure that their application is safe. So that's fine. Uh, that's normal. Now, so they go on and sort of say that if you have overweight or obese patients, again, weight loss first, but GLP-1s, SGLT-2s actually have got this another benefit, which is actually weight loss. So again, they... they first and second. If you have a normal weight patient, then it's not going to be GLP-1, SGLT-2, instead DPP-4 or a sulfonylurea. If you have a patient who's at increased risk of hypoglycemia, then DPP-4 inhibitors are very safe. If you have a patient with kidney disease, diabetic kidney disease, stages 3 to 5, then SGLT-2 is actually the first line um, uh, which is recommended, sort of similar to the ADA. And then if uh, you've given already, you need something else to bring the HbA1c down, GLP-1s, and again, if you need further, further, you just keep going down uh, the line, trying to reach your HbA1c target. If you have high risk of CBD, GLP-1s first, then SGLT-2s, okay? Um, and the reason for this is that uh, there is primary and secondary prevention. Secondary prevention means patients who already cannot MI once or stroke once, and you want to prevent them from having a second event. Now, primary prevention means they are high risk, they are a smoker, they have strong family history, they are having diabetes, uh, hypertension, etc. but they haven't had their first MI yet, okay? Actually, the data is actually stronger with GLP-1 receptor agonists to prevent them from having the first one and then followed by SGLT-2s. Um, ASCVD, meaning atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, that means they already have MI, stroke, etc. Uh, they come out equal, SGLT-2 and GLP-1 come out equal, okay? And then you move down the line, if you give these already, HbA1c is still not at target, you can give uh, all these other agents uh, you can see down below. And here again, heart failure, SGLT2, the data is very, very strong. You can even give it to patients who don't have diabetes, but they have heart failure. Um, so yeah, that's how the Malaysian CPG actually uh, um, recommends things. Now, what I, I do need to sort of uh, comment just moving back and showing you all these things. Um, ooh, 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 ooh. Sorry, I know this is probably making you dizzy, but if I, what I do need you to sort of understand is that of course patients are not unidimensional, okay? You can have a patient who say has got DKD. And so if you follow this CPG, you would be giving SGLT2 inhibitors, okay, as a first line. However, we do know that patients who have got DKD, diabetic kidney disease, are at high risk 
of cardiovascular disease, right? Chronic kidney disease is a cardiac risk factor in itself. You can argue that. So if you follow the next one, okay, high risk of CVD, then actually it should be a GLP-1 that you're actually giving. And patients who've got diabetic kidney disease who are also in, at increased risk of hypoglycemia. So instead, should you be giving them a DPP-4 inhibitor? So what you actually need then is patients are not going to be monodimensional, unidimensional. Patients are going to be patients. They are multidimensional, okay? And they may not have money, yeah? Okay, I, I wish there was an extra one, one more uh, 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 category. Patient with no money? Money. What should you do? Very simple. The traditional one, metformin, sulfonylurea, insulin. I think it's a very realistic scenario, actually. Uh, but of course, it doesn't look fancy. It doesn't look atas, la, you know? It doesn't look paradigm, okay? <laughs> um, so... Um, um, what I would actually say is that you actually need to sort of um, understand your patient. You need to sort of understand what is the thing that is perhaps the most important that you want to help them with, okay? Uh, what is the thing that they will actually in, be able to afford? Now, GLP ones, they are actually injectables. So if your patient doesn't want to touch them, right? No matter what, right? I would rather die than touch them. Okay, then, then, then you are more focused on the oral drugs already. Okay. Tacha means uh, injection. We have a lot of non Chinese speaking. So, or Wusi, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so injection, right? Uh, um, yeah, so uh, uh, again, um, the powers that be, the people who write uh, uh, these kinds of guidelines. Right, they are giving you a guideline to say that a patient. What I'm telling you is that you know you can have a patient who has DKD and they are high risk of C CVD. So which one do you follow? Right, so you need to understand your patient. You need to understand when these drugs also can be used. If I were to give another lecture on like what are the contraindications and indications, blah blah blah, side effects of SGLTs, it might be yeah, it might might be too long this lecture okay so you need to go off and learn um during the q a if you want me to answer uh, like what are the contraindications etc how to use i will um but yeah yeah i think this is where i'm going to sort of move on so yeah no money no talk um these are some of the sort of uh, ways that you look at a patient uh, how you would actually prescribe if your patient has got different uh, risk factors okay right so in summary i would actually say h 1 p remains important okay just like bp achieving a bp target remains important okay um hba one c don't forget one of the things about diabetes is that it's so much more broad range of problems that you can get from a high sugar right like hypertension is not linked to sepsis and tuberculosis and foot ulcers but high glucose is, okay? Um, um, HB1, uh, uh, number one leading cause of blindness is not hypertensive retinopathy. It's actually diabetic yeah. retino retinopathy in the yeah. developed world. Okay, undeveloped world in the middle of Africa, yeah, la, you get all these uh, infections, etc. But HB1C still remains important. However, now have got drugs with powerful extra glycemic effects. That means effects beyond the glycemic lowering, right? These two classes, SGLT2 inhibitors, which are oral, GLP-1 receptor agonists, which so far are injectable in Malaysia, and they have this cardiovascular risk reduction. And it's not just reducing the risk of MI. Some of them actually reduce the risk of death, okay? Um, there's this heart failure reduction. And in fact, they're so good at redu reducing heart failure, SGLT2s, that um, even in non-diabetes patients, you can use them now. You have this renal risk reduction, protecting your kidneys from declining. Um, and they also have this uh, additional weight loss benefit as well, both of these agents. So what is there not to like, right? Well, what is there not to like is yeah, expensive. Oh, yes. That's, uh, Expenses is I'm uh, taking a... Yeah, I'm trying to take a for cigar that is a uh, sample <laughs> uh, to lose weight. Are you sure you want to say this out loud in front of everybody, Betty Tay? Yo. 
So how? So how? So how? So how? So yeah, to me, okay. Like, but never lost weight yet. <laughs> you need a GLP one. Come and see me, Betty Tay. I won't charge you. <laughs> okay. So, so what I would actually say is that you need to know these new drugs, SGLT twos and GLP ones. Once they become more affordable you're going to be using it. So you need to sort of familiarize with yourself with it. Sorry, I haven't really gone in depth on how you would describe it, what to look out for, what to monitor, etc. I think they will ask, uh, yeah, they, we will just invite them to ask questions about all these drugs. Uh, and these drugs. whatever, yeah. I think we will, yeah, you and you need to know your patients. Every patient going to be different one, okay? Yeah. So once you start clinical practice, you will know that no two fellows are the same. You've got patients who will die, 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 don't want to take drugs, right? The statin caused my muscles to fall out of my arms. Um, and the, the uh, you know, uh, the metformin causes my kidney to be broken. Sorry, Alex, can you come? Because I can't hear you when you sit back. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, I'm, I think my mic's not, not that great. Yeah, yeah, so uh, you need to know your drugs and you need to know your patient even more importantly, right? Once you start clinical practice. Um, yeah, so I think with that, I have finished this lecture very early. Um, okay, that's... Yeah, do you want to ask me any questions? Okay, it's a very short talk uh, and I have to comment that you... If you stole those slides, those slides were very nice. Fantastic. I love it so much. I never steal anything. Okay. Everything here, this is CPG. This is all CPG slides. So is oh, there a problem? Oh, no, 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 no. It's so beautiful. Especially when you, it's like, a, you know, this multi-slide kind of technique. So I need to learn how to make those slides. If you want to learn how to make those slides, it's going to cost you more than Nyonya Kue, Betty Tay. <laughs> okay, we will go back to diabetes again. Uh, okay, so I have okay. a few questions. Okay. Go on. Now, this GLP-1, okay, they're all injectables, is it? Yes, in the United States and in Europe, there's actually, actually an oral version available. Um, the oral version is... Okay, so... The oral version is extremely expensive, but it is oral. Lah. Uh, the problem is GLP-1, GLP stands for glucagon-like peptide. And as you know, once you put peptide into our GI tract, you swallow it as a tablet, uh, it, it gets digested, right? Um, so what happens is the injectable versions, for example, are one milligram. The oral versions are 14 milligrams, 15 milligrams. So the cost of it is actually... Um, making the same drug, but it's almost like 14 times the milligrams. So the cost of it is actually pretty high. Um, yeah, but, but in Malaysia, it's only available as injections. And you generally have three uh, which are available, which is liraglutide, which is a daily injection, semaglutide, which is a weekly injection, and dulaglutide, which is also a weekly injection. Is it all weekly injection? Uh, no, uh, liraglutide is a daily, semaglutide, also called ozempic, is a weekly, and uh, dulaglutide, which is called trulicity, is also a weekly injection. And how much would the, a month of uh, GLP-1 cost? Um, anywhere between 400 to 800 ringgit per month. Per month, huh? Okay, because uh, I'm sure... There are many doctors who are either GPs and then we... Now, even I myself in the hospital setup, I'm not familiar with many of the new drugs except those that can sweat and you know, lost them. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, uh, let, let me show you uh, since you asked, yes. Betty. Uh, la, 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 la. So this is all dulaglutide. Um, data, some of which I've shown you already. This is what the, the, the pen for Dula Glutide okay. looks like. It's very similar to the pen which was used uh, by Sanofi, I think, for their, um, um, what do you call that, cholesterol uh, reducing uh, injectable? Oh, no, Sanofi. 
Abjen, sorry. Uh, yeah. Not Sanofi. Um, I know my friend Brenda Long sells it. Yeah, yes. yeah. Yeah, so, so yeah, it's just very simple, much more simpler than insulin because the dose is pre-selected for you already. Uh, all you have to do is push this button. You have to, of course, you have to take off the cap and apply this to your abdomen, okay? Uh, the needle is hidden up here. You don't actually see the needle. All you need to do is just push and then the thing will deliver and it's just once a week. Uh, so yeah, this, this is uh, uh, kind of another paradigm shift if you like okay so this is a uh, devices are if better. it's not for the price um it is the best kind of treatment for for diabetes not just because um of the benefit it comes to all the patient from your evidence based uh randomized study but it is so convenient once a week injection you know and you don't even let's say you are person who dare not inject yourself, okay, once a week going to the GP to get it injected is not a big problem. This is once a week. <laughs> Actually, you don't just... even need to go to the GP. This is yeah, that's super, right. super wow. easy. But it's so super have to, easy and once just have a to week. press this only. But it's just very expensive. Okay. Yes. Some, uh, Dr. Siva asked whether can a disciplined lifestyle and diet control and exercise alone be adequate in trying to achieve good control? I think no need uh, an endocrinologist to tell you that. I no. bet they tell you tell. <laughs> no. Okay. Of course, if you have like a pre-diabetic uh, or family history of diabetes, you want them to start lifestyle changes. Yeah, maybe. But once you are diabetic, right, and they will have, you see it. We have, throughout the talk, Dr. Alexander Tan has said that Previously, we have been always looking at HbA1c and adding new, a new drug to the regime every time because you do not achieve the HbA1c is very, very common. Patients with diabetes, it's very difficult to have a disciplined lifestyle and diet control and exercise, believe me. That's why uh, a lot of cardiologists have so busy. Where are you, Alexander? Okay, I am ask. in Petaling Jaya. Okay. I can't see. Oh, I can't see you. Okay, okay. okay so, la, you want to see me, see me. La. Okay, fine. Okay, so uh, have you anything to add to Dr. Siva's end? Right. So, um, diet control and exercise, exactly like Betty says, if uh, you, you, maybe you see a lot more uh, early diabetes la, um, than us in hospital. So if you have patients who are newly diagnosed and their HbA1c, let's say 6.6, .6, like very, you know, not that high, then it's possible. But what you do need to warn them is that this scenario is not going to go on forever. This is what I tell all my patients. Um, in five years time, right? If you're 60 years old today, in five years time, you're not going to be 60 years old. You're going to be 65. Your pancreas and your liver and your kidneys and your everything is going to be five years older, in 10 years time, guess what, right? Your pancreas and your liver and your kidney and your everything is again 10 years older. So it, it, you are getting weaker as time goes by. That's how I explain it to my patient. And you may need medications as time goes by. So from what I would say is, if you have such patients who are just on diet control and exercise and the HbA1c is under control, fine, but you need to warn them that this is not going to last forever. At some point in their life, they will need medication and they need to be monitored to find that point in their life when they actually go over. Um, I rarely see these kind of patients because like most of the time people refer to me when the HB1C is something crazy like 13% or something like that. Okay, um, uh, Kim asked, uh, sorry, cut, off, cut you off suddenly like that. It's okay. Are you for or against metforming being yeah, first right. line and why? So the way I answer this question uh, is, yeah, metformin is dirt cheap. Honestly, it's really, really dirt cheap. In fact, it's cheaper than dirt. Yeah, <laughs> because what, what, what all these drug companies will tell me is when you, when you have uh, two drugs, right, you combine the metformin with Januvia, for example, they said, oh, we, we price it the same such that uh, you buy Januvia or Januvim, Janumet, uh, is the metformin not counted? Okay. 
Now, the other day, my wife asked me to go and buy fertilizer, which is basically asking me to go and buy dirt, right? So, for me, it's free war. Dirt, I have to go and buy. So, it's cheaper than dirt, law. Okay, so, um, um, uh, that would be the one good thing that you can do. Uh, that would be one good thing. The other good thing about metformin would be that there's plenty of clinical experience. Like, everybody has used metformin before, all right? However, if you just imagine metformin being a new drug which was recently launched and discovered, if you imagine like some weird world, okay, don't talk about the cost and the, the clinical experience. If metformin was invented today, okay, it would not be first line because it doesn't have the benefits of all of these others. Um, so that, that would be uh, uh, a purely scientific argument to sort of say that, look, metformin's role um, if in patients who can afford to pay for better drugs, metformin's role is I, I don't give it as first line necessarily nowadays. However, if if patient is poor, then yeah, la, metformin first line. La. Would hypo yeah. be a problem if SGLT2 used in non-diabetic? No. Hypo will not be a problem because SGLT2s, they know how to stop working at a certain uh, threshold one uh, of, of uh, 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 this one. It's not as though they cause you to to, to, to lower the sugar completely. So it wouldn't, in non-diabetic with heart failure, hypo was not a problem in the trials. So yeah. this SGLT2, a month's supply, how much would it usually cost? Because we really 200 have- 200 bucks. About 200 bucks. Okay, so fairly, uh, fairly um, okay. okay, can afford. Considering how much benefit confers to the patient. We Absolutely. have a um, question from Bato Polyclinic. He asked uh, Dr. Alexander, will a short course of oral steroid for eczema exacerbate existing diabetes mellitus? Yeah, so, so short course, low dose steroid, if you need to give it, you give it. La. All right. The diabetes will go up for those few days, but as long as it comes down again when you stop the steroids, it should be okay. Steroids should not be, um, ideally, should not be given long term. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, it may worsen it for a short period, but a few days never mind, you know, can live with it, not a problem. Can a patient start both uh, SGLT2 and GLP1 at the same time? The patient has no contraindication for and have money, have money. Have <laughs> you money. must, uh, you must uh, cap that word, have money. <laughs> money. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would. Uh, you can, you can, but I would not do it that way. When you introduce new medications to a patient, you yeah, do need right. to be very careful because suddenly patient comes back and tells you you got headache or, you know, whatever side effect. Is it because of A or B? You know, so you got to be really careful, lah, you know. Um, so what I would do is you're treating a chronic disease. You're not treating an acute disease. It doesn't mean it's not, it's not there's like... There's no rush. Uh, there's no rush. Yeah, it's not an acute MI where you have to give like aspirin stat and this stat and that stat. So chronic disease, ma, you also take time to get to know your patient better, build up rapport, right? And you start the, uh, probably what I'll do is uh, not many people would, would take the, the GLP-1 off the bat. Lah. You give them an SGLT2, see how it goes, all right? And I think um, very, I, yeah. okay, let me add on this, this thing about the, um, Okay, these are very new drugs, um, and um, if you're not familiar with any drugs, I think that uh, more importantly for you is to also tr you know, uh, try it out slowly. Yeah, so it is best that way. Okay, uh, Dr. Cole asked whether I actually use uh, SGLT2 on non-diabetic with heart failure. Uh, the answer is no, not yet. But uh, as you may have heard my conversation with Alex that I have been using SGLT2 non-diabetic middle-aged woman with uh, slightly, <laughs> slightly uh, overweight, uh, that's me. <laughs> okay, so how uh, G-Link G -Link asks, Dr. Alex, will a short course of that, I think we have already yeah, yeah, answered that. Answer that. Okay, uh, Shafiq asks, why weight loss is not part of the treatment of diabetes? Uh, I see many successful reverse their diabetes after sleep. 
isn't tied to diabetes. And that's a very good question, especially yep. now that bariatric um, surgery is so common and so um, acceptable, especially by some of our ministers. <laughs> and uh, with very good result. I'm just trying a uh, GGL, SGL, bitter. I'm not going to bariatric surgery yet. <laughs> but um, I have myself seen patients who had gone for bariatric surgery and Good lost either. 30, 40 uh, kg. Bad. And also had the, the diabetes kind of, kind of reverse. What have you got to say? Alex? Okay, so there's, there's several. Uh, so Betty, sorry, I, I know you, you have trouble hearing. So um, I'll try to come closer to the computer. Okay. There's many points I need to, to make about this. Okay. Now, um, how much does sleeve gastrectomy cost? Okay. Uh, what are the risks which are actually involved? So first of all, sleeve gastrectomy is not cheap. It's not like everybody, every patient with diabetes in the world, you should automatically send them to have sleeve gastrectomy. Again, I like to have this alternate universe kind of uh, views of life. Imagine if the only treatment for many years for type 2 diabetes is to have a sleeve gastrectomy, right? We'll never be able to end up, you know, people will be, you know, too many, overwhelmed. And then somebody invented metformin, somebody invented drugs. Everybody would be saying, yay, now I don't need to do sleeve gastrectomy to cure my diabetes, right? At least I can just take medications and control it. So, you know, sometimes we are fascinated by these fancy things. Okay, but, but we have to be very practical. It's, it's expensive. There is a risk of uh, 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 complications. Like any other surgeries. Like, like any, any other surgery, yeah. 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 So, but it can reverse. You're, you're, you're correct. Now, the other thing is, as you go through your clinical practice, have you ever met patients who have diabetes, but they are thin or normal weight? And they are these patients. Now, if you have a patient who is, um, let's say, 40 kilos, right? and has got diabetes, right? Because they are Asian, they're small size, these small size old aunties. Are you going to give them a sleeve gastrectomy and lose 40 kilos? Because 40 minus 40 is zero, okay? So, um, so yeah, again, it might not work for- uh, uh, All patient. diabetic patients. Yeah. Now, if you do have like many patients, they are obese and overweight, yes, then of course, weight loss is going to be recommended. But where, where, where is the point at which you are going to recommend a surgery for weight loss, right? What is that point in time? And usually what we have to say is that they have to be obese. They have to be a, have a BMI, which is higher than 30. Plus they also have uh, other comorbidities, for example, obstructive sleep apnea or diabetes, hypertension, okay? So it makes it more and more worthwhile for you to undergo surgery. Now, if you, if you are just overweight, you go and do a sleeve gastrectomy. You're overweight without OSA, without DM, without, then you go and do a sleeve gastrectomy. Then that, that, that's a bit risky and dangerous, lah, you know. So yeah, weight loss is actually recommended for obese type 2 diabetes patients. It is in our Malaysian CPG. If you follow those boxes that I showed you earlier, right? You look at the overweight obese category. What did they say? Lose weight. Yeah, it is recommended. Um, is bariatric surgery recommended for all patients? No, lah, because you have to be practical about it, right? Okay, it is a surgery at, at the end of the day. Sleeve gastrectomy is not the only one. Ru and Y exists. Uh, iliopancreatic diversion exists. Uh, so yeah, again, uh, uh, it can work. It can reverse, all right? But surgery has its own risk, law. Yeah. And now show us, is the injection, is it once a week? I think we have answered that. Uh, there's once a week and there's daily doses for uh, GLP-1. Okay, Lawrence asks, if a patient with history of heart disease and type 2 diabetes, currently HbA1c is well controlled with injected insulin, is SGLT2 or GLP, GLP inhibitor, should it use, replace, and how can we start if yes? I think that uh, the evidence is, um, is quite substantial to say that um, we can, we should use one or both the agents. So I don't think there is a study to show 
both agents being more beneficial than one agent, right? So uh, currently it's one or the other. If we were just to treat it for heart disease prevention or let's say um, solid end things like that. Uh, how would you start then, uh, Dr. Alexander Tan? Yes, Dr. Betty Tay. Okay, um, so what, what, what I would actually do is um, if your HbA1c is a target, but you want to give them the cardiovascular and the renal benefits from say an SGLT2, I would actually uh, reduce the insulin to start off with but probably, probably about 20%. And then the secret is to monitor, monitor, monitor for hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia from there. Lah. So HbA1c, for example, is 6.5%. Patient is on insulin, quite happy, but you want to add in an SGLT2, you know that you have to reduce the insulin. The way I started is, the way I do it is basically just minus off by 20% and then we adjust from there. You know, every patient is different. You do need to have uh, this kind of adjustment period. Likewise for GLP-1, you want to start a GLP-1 for let's say weight benefit in addition to the cardiovascular benefit, blah, blah, blah. Drop the insulin by about 20% across the board uh, before you, you, you uh, as you start and then uh, adjust again from there. Lah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so that, that would generally be how I do it. Kim asked whether SGLT2 might replace insulin in the future. No, I, I don't I don't uh, I don't foresee that. Um, SGLT2s, GLP1s will delay the need for insulin in patients with type 2. Okay. Uh, but once they need insulin, they may need insulin now. Okay. Must remember that uh, if we use the newer agents like SGLT2 or GLP1 inhibitor. Uh, we're going to prolong the life. And we prolong the life, we prolong the disease of diabetes. And then the disease then becomes a ever-going demand for, for newer drugs to be added, right? Most times, these this diseases like diabetes and high blood pressure, they are progressive as they age. The longer the duration of the disease, the harder it is to treat. So eventually, yes, we will need to add on. Uh, Siva asked, should pre-diabetics start medication uh, or wait till further deterioration of HbA1c? That's a very good question, actually. Yeah, so you need to know your patient. Okay, so at the moment for pre-diabetes, uh, there's data only for two, uh, two medications. One is metformin. The other one is acarbose, in addition to uh, lifestyle changes, diet and exercise, right? Uh, so you need to know, uh, so, so you have these two medications. Have a discussion with your patient whether they want to start or not, okay? There are many, many things that they need to consider. Most of my patients, die die also don't want to take if they have pre-diabetes. Um, they would rather wait. Um, they would rather do their own diet and exercise, which is fine. You know, they, they are trying to take control of their life. They're trying to put an effort in. That's fine. Um, so realistically in Malaysia, I find many patients do not want to start taking medications. Uh, uh, the other thing of, is, of course, um, that once they start taking medications, you know, their insurance uh, uh, status changes as well. You know, they have to declare to insurance that they've started on metformin, even if it's on pre-diabetes, etc., um, now, if, however, they do take metformin, for example, uh, there are clear benefits as well with metformin. You actually do delay your onset for diabetes by like up to um, five to 10 years. Okay, so your transformation from pre-diabetes to diabetes, you can actually delay it for a longer uh, period of time. You actually also reduce your risk of uh, developing early retinopathy, uh, early atherosclerotic changes, all those kind of things, lah, scientific things. Lah. But from a pragmatic point of view, very rare have I ever seen a pre-diabetic willingly, willingly want to take medicines. One, so uh, yeah, you need to have a discussion with them, lor. A new real Anwar asked whether G S G L T. Okay, uh, so I think we had a very had a lecture yeah. on that. Yeah, you can't. You need, yeah, you need to use insulin in DKA. In fact, S G L T two can make it worse. Can for us, if we start a patient on SGLT2 inhibitor or GLP1, 
um, what are the other parameters we need to monitor beside HbA1c? Uh, the bank balance. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, so uh, um, obviously they may start to experience weight loss. Uh, I have had thin patients starting on these agents and they have tremendous weight loss. So they are already skinny, then they skinny some more. Oh my goodness. So, so yeah, in the that end, I had to- That's great, man. Okay, go on. Hi, Betty. <laughs> the world does not revolve around you, lah. Okay, okay. So, uh, um, so yeah. So the other thing is that um, with SGLT2 uh, inhibitors, because they, they cause glycosuria, they cause you to excrete glucose through your urine, right? They drag that high glucose, which is in your bloodstream, and they put it into the toilet bowl. Um, so one thing that you do need to emphasize to your patients is that they, they may experience genital tract irritation, or in fact, uh, they may get uh, uh, you know, genital tract candidiasis, etc. So you need to warn them that their genital hygiene must be good, that they need to wash, um, um, uh, uh, yeah, all those kinds of things. Uh, so that's one of the things that needs to I ask be you, in both cases of SGLT, inhibitor and GLP-1, yeah. they have an increased uh, sugar in the urine? No, only okay. SGLT-2. Only SGLT-2, right? So in that case, that the patients who use glucose stick, the urine should not... It will definitely be positive. Yeah. So we don't use glucose stick anymore. If we do see glucose 4 plus uh, in, in, in their uh, urine FEME, okay, it means they are taking the drug. Right, so uh, you know, in the past, if you see glucose four plus in the urine FME, you will tell the patient, "Oh, this is bad." But nowadays, if they are on an SGLT two and you see glucose four plus, I'm saying the the drug is working. You're obviously taking it. So it's yeah, exactly a shift in paradigm. Yeah, you have to say that word, man. Uh, okay, so, now we yeah. have really neglected DPP four inhibitor. Is there okay. any evidence for similar? Um, outcome for cardiovascular risk, renal protection, and so stroke and death. With I mean, if God, I would have told you. So the very fact that I haven't told you means don't God. Don't have. Huh? Elect. Don't have. Yeah. So um, are these two drugs recommended for women with diabetes as well? Uh, yeah, not, definitely cannot contraindicated in pregnancy. There's only a few things that you can use in pregnancy. Metformin is one, insulin is the other. Okay, good. And um, how does it work to reduce all this risk if it's not reduction of just your glycemic status? How does that it work is, on heart failure? That is the million dollar question. They, nobody uh, knows. Yeah, nobody. Basically, nobody knows lah. There, there are multiple theories out there. Um, one of them is on reducing epicardial fat. One of them is on uh, the NHE three receptor in the myocardium, sodium hydrogen exchange. Yeah, yeah, which is an off okay. effect of SGLT two. And then there is also another. Um, uh, a theory which um, looks at myocardial energetics. That means what happens is instead of giving glucose to the myocardium to work, um, what SGLT2 sometimes can do is it can actually give ketones to the myocardium to work. So it's uh, working at the cellular level. Yeah, uh, but this is a theory, lah, Betty. Nobody has proven okay. anything yet. Lah. So basically, I uh, don't know, McDonald. Okay, we have spoken for more than an hour now. I just want to, uh, before I even thank you, I want to emphasize one thing. Never forget your statin in diabetic patients, please. Because that's my favorite drug. <laughs> statin. Hey, I thought you would be aspirin. No. Um, yeah, I think statin is more important than aspirin in diabetic patients that have no cardiovascular event before. So for primary prevention, um, even primary prevention, statin must, must be on.
I can't hear you at all. Uh, now, nowadays, very cheap also. So good. Lah. Yes, very cheap. Yes. So, but the fact is, I want to say this because a lot of people still don't believe in statins. I find a lot of doctors um, neglecting statins um, in their practice and solely because they themselves don't believe in statin. So, any more last minute questions? Anyone at all? If when do we start statin? There's another lecture. La. <laughs> <laughs> when do we start statin? The moment that you're diagnosed to have diabetes. Yeah. Yes. When you're diagnosed. Um, to hey, actually many, no, why I say is a, there's many indications or like post, post MI, post stroke. Um, yes. Yeah, high, high lipid levels. Uh, got a lot or when do we start statins? No, I mean for I, diabetic patients. Already, yeah. Yes, for diabetic patients with no previous history of uh, MI stroke or, okay, if the cholesterol level is less than two, more than 2.6, ideally uh, you should target at 1.8 MP. Okay. okay, so with this, um, I'd like to thank um, Alexander Tan for this wonderful lecture and beautiful slides. I truly, truly am so... Um, Fascinated with the slides. I want to learn how to make those Dude, slides. You got you. It's you gotta give me more than Nonya Kueh, ah, Betty Tay. Okay, okay. I'll buy you lunch. Okay. <laughs> Once I lose weight, I can go and buy you lunch. Okay. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> okay. Next week. Next week, I am giving a talk. That's why I want to make such nice slides because I'm going to speak on um heart failure, and uh, Ahmad Niza is going to join me. So uh, I hope you come on board. Okay, we will also add in SGLT too. <laughs> and maybe borrow your slides, Alex. <laughs> can, can I email you? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so maybe you give us your slides um, in PDF form so I can share it uh, at our medical forum. Do join our medical forum uh, on Telegram or like our page in Beating Hearts uh, on Facebook. And I see you next week. Bye. Oh, and next, uh, tomorrow night at 9 o'clock, we will discuss a case on Telegram on Arrhythmia, a case that I saw today. Okay, bye. Okay, bye, Thanks, everyone. thanks.